is your relationship with time? Are you wired and tired, stressed and overwhelmed, busy and going nowhere, or just want to scale your business? Welcome to Take Back Time with your host, Penny Zanker. Penny focuses on books, strategies, tools, and tips to help you work smarter and approach your time more strategically. As a result, you can have more energy, focus, and get more done in less time. Be more efficient and effective. Get ready to take back time. Hello, and welcome to Take Back Time. My name is Penny Zanker, and I am excited to talk to you guys today about a really important topic. We're going to talk about overwhelm, and I think that that is a perfect topic for not just after, let's call it after the pandemic. I don't know that we're at the end of it, but it's a perfect topic for any time because just with life's fast pace, digital and emotional and all of these different things that are coming at us at the same time, demanding our attention, it's something that we really need to talk about and get a hold of. And today I have a master with me. Robert Roipel is with me. Who is that guy, right? Yeah, he is the master. And he's going to share with us some of his experience. I mean, he's an international best-selling author. He's an app designer, an entrepreneur, and trainer who spent the past 18 plus years traveling around the world and sharing his passions. He also shares the stage with many top trainers and thought leaders And he's really on his journey. He draws from his humble beginnings to his financial freedom at the age of 32. We're going to hear more about these stories and how he's overcome the idea of overwhelm and how you guys can as well. So Robert, welcome to the show. (laughs) Thanks, Penny. And I I can tell you, I feel an instant connection when I know I'm not the only one that does the finger thing. (laughs) Well, is it over? You know, like you were saying, it's over. Is it really over? I mean, you know, what determines that? We'll see. Yeah. And see, I've done this overseas and the people just look at me like, what is that? So I so love that you do the same thing because I get it, even though other people may not. Hey, that doesn't matter. We've got our own self-congratulation society here and we get each other and that's all that matters. (laughs) That's it. I'm absolutely feeling blessed to be here and ready to have some fun with you and your audience. Awesome. Well, I'm excited for it. And You know, I know everybody's like, okay, Robert was financially free at the age of 32. What does this guy have to say about overwhelm? (laughs) Well, tell us about that. (laughs) Well, I don't know if anybody else would agree with this, but to me, financial stress has got to be one of the worst stresses out there. And you talk about getting into overwhelm. And so before I became financially free, I was deep in debt. And that's where the overwhelm was coming. Gotcha. my wife and I, we both, youngest of our families, both born into families where we're not entrepreneurs. You work hard. You find a job that's going to be, let's be able to do this, find a job that's going to be secure, whether you like it or not. The one that pays you the most and the one that's most secure. You do that. Even if you hate the job, you do it to take care of your family. Mm-hmm. And that's what we both grew up with. And so entering the workforce, that's what I did. And I'm trying to find the best job that's going to pay me the most and be the most secure. And by the time I'm 21, I'm laid off from three different jobs. And I'm like, especially the last one, I thought I was going to be with them for 40 years. They had factories all over North America. I saw myself being a general manager. So imagine my shock when I walk into the office on a Monday after having a week off and the general manager called me in his office and says, oh, well, I'll let you know we're shutting the factory down. You were laid off as of last Friday. And I'm like, and you couldn't have told me that before I went on holidays. He's like, oh, we didn't know. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we didn't know. Yeah. But, you know, I actually you didn't want to know before you went on holiday anyway. Very true. But I might have spent a little less money. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about is it over? Well, I got to now go home and say to my wife, go home because I don't have a job anymore. Right. And so overwhelm it really played a big part of my life, especially young. I feel blessed that I learned the lesson, though, then that if I wanted to have success, I had to take control of it. So out of necessity, because where I live here in Alberta, when our oil prices are up in the world, we boom. We have lots of work. Everybody's making money. Everybody's yep. happy. When oil prices are down, we go through an oil bust. And it, you know, it's funny. I look back now, hindsight being 2020, it goes in almost like eight-year cycles. And I love a bumper sticker I saw on the back of a truck once. It said, 
God, please let there be one more oil boom. I promise not to piss it away this time. <laughs> because when times are good, we just get into that rhythm. But we're in an oil bus and I can't find a job. So out of necessity, I start delivering pizzas. Because luckily my parents taught me you do whatever it takes to support your family. I'm newly married. So I start delivering pizzas for Domino's Pizza. I'm able to go on to become a manager out of necessity. Why? Because my franchisee sold the store I was working in, bought two in a city an hour and a half away. And I was afraid I was going to lose my job if I, the new owner came in. So I'm like, what can I do? What can I do? Hey, you have two stores. Do you need a manager? I didn't even know if I wanted to be a manager. But to me, that was a path of security. And so two weeks later, I start managing. My wife becomes my assistant manager. We start working to open a close seven days a week. And imagine our surprise when I'm now qualified to be a franchisee. We don't have money, but I'm qualified. And all of a sudden, our franchisee says, I'm tired of Domino's Pizza. I'm selling the two stores. Again, instantly, it's like the first people that are fired are the managers when new owners come in. So we came up with the crazy idea we're going to buy the store we're working in. Now, we didn't have any money. But one thing that served me well, Penny, is I have passion. Passion is my favorite word in the whole world. And we made a lot of mistakes over a three to four month period learning, can we buy a business with no money of our own? And we ended up actually buying both of his stores. We did it with 100% financing and we became franchisees and it was like, oh, we've got it made. But well, sort we started, of, you own two franchises. <laughs> yeah. Still got to run them, right? <laughs> yeah. And a lot of hard work. And we were franchisees Absolutely. for nine years and we went through a lot of ups and downs, staffing, stress, having to change over the looks of the stores. But the big overwhelm came at around the eight year mark because we're not enjoying Domino's Pizza anymore. We don't want to do it. And we're going deep, deep, deep in debt. And we're also in $150,000 in debt and not sure what we're going to do. That's that financial overwhelm. And it's just like, oh my goodness, how do we get through this? And that's actually when we were introduced to personal development for the first time. Well, I shouldn't say the first time because my brother-in-law and not to age myself, Penny, but I remember we're at home and he goes, hey, there's this guy named Tony Robbins. I just bought his cassette tapes. You should listen to them. (laughs) I'm I'm like, I'm not listening to cassette tapes, whoever this guy is. Right. But out of necessity again, all of a sudden- Well, I want to stop you for a second because, and I want to come back to your story, but you you use that word necessity a couple of times. And I know you're probably using it intentionally, but I want to challenge you on that because really- You were being in each of these cases, yes, there was a pressure to find security, right? And we're all driven to find security. But in that same context, people make a choice and you were still proactive. Even though there was a necessity, you saw an opportunity. So I want to make sure that people who are listening are clear that you were looking for opportunities to provide that security, but you were looking for those opportunities. They didn't just fall in your lap. And they weren't like, we all have necessities. I'm a stickler with words. And so I just want to make sure that people are listening. This didn't fall into your lap. You sought after it. And you also didn't accept no, right? Because I know you've got a lot more to the story, but you could have just accepted defeat. You were fired from that job. You could have just welled up in a ball and sat there. And that's a choice. And it's also a choice to say, I'm going to do whatever I can. I just want to point out and ask you around that, like some motivating factors around that, because I know somebody who was in a situation, they had a really good job as a consultant, they got laid off and they refused to go to work at like a Starbucks or Wegmans or a pizza delivery or anything that could provide the day-to-day expenses and cover those. Instead, he chose to live in his car. He lost his apartment, chose to live in his car. And it went downhill from there, right? Of course, then he broke it into depression. And so before we go on with your story, I want to understand a little bit about those early days, because of course, the stronger you get in it, the better you get at it. What helped you to make that decision to take action versus inaction? Oh, and I don't know if this is going to be a video, but if it is, your audience is going to see that I'm smiling from ear to ear because Penny... You know, hindsight being 2020, I fully clearly see it now. And not many of the people that I do interviews with catch that. And they bring it back to that. So I am just like so happy you did. Because now I see it was choices. 
But back then it felt like a necessity. And the one thing that made the difference, two words, my wife. (laughs) And here's what I mean by that. I'm very blessed that my wife and I, we met when we were 13. We started dating when we were 16. And that's when she tackled me to the ground because I wasn't noticing her. We started dating the next day. And then we got married when we were 19. And last weekend, we actually, of the time of this recording, we celebrated our 32nd wedding anniversary. Wow, just last congratulations. Weekend. That's awesome. The reason I say my wife is because in my upbringing, I would have given up. The greatest opportunity could have come my way. The first little hiccup, the first little bump I was taught. But one of the gifts that my wife gives me is she's not willing to let me play smaller than I am. And so even at times, so like when I was let go from that third job, I was in that party. I was in wallowing in it. And she said, so what's next? I'm like, well, there's no work. I've worked for three months. I've been counting the payment. I've been putting out resumes. She goes, so start doing something. And because I had delivered pizzas before, I started doing that. And so, yeah, when my franchisee sold a store, in the opportunity part two, I love that you picked up on that as well. Why did I become a manager? Because I was the one busting my butt as a driver and the franchisee saw my value. Yeah. He knew the worker I was. So absolutely. Had I just been a driver that was afraid to lose the job and gone and said, let me be a manager, it probably would have been a no because he had other people in line. Right. But sure. because I was taking shifts that nobody else wanted, I created that opportunity. So you're so right on that as well, which was awesome. And the same thing with being the franchisee. You know, the backstory of that is the reason we kept going was my wife kept pushing it. Think bigger. Think outside of the box. And at the time in Canada, there was a company about to take over what's called a master franchise. So they were going to be the master franchisees for the whole country. Three of the four, the father and two of the brothers that owned the company, all lived in my delivery area. They had been ordering pizzas from me for over a year. They loved, we didn't know who they were, but we treated every customer like gold. And so I already had the opportunity because when I said, okay, we want to be franchisees, they're like, yes you are going to be franchisees because they knew who we were. We had created that by just treating everybody like gold. So I'm so happy you picked up on that. So people are out there thinking, well, I don't have a wife like that. So what do you have to say to them? Who do you have in your life? See, we've heard the saying, surround yourself with like-minded people. And that's great. But I just got an awakening a year ago from a mentor because I say it on the stage, how many of you love being in a room full of like-minded people? Everybody's like, yeah. And that's what I believed. And then a new perspective came in. He said, don't surround yourself with like-minded people. Because if you're at a bus stop going to the mall with four other people, you're all like-minded. You're waiting for the bus. It's going to take you to the mall. Surround yourself with growth-minded people. And those are the people willing to have those hard conversations. Like how many other hosts, Penny, would have stopped me in the mid-sentence and said, no, let's go deeper. This is crap, blah, 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 right? I didn't say it was crap. I just, I no, know that I want to have a conversation about yeah. what's really going on. And I knew you were going to get to it, but like, I wanted to cut to the chase. <laughs> and I love that. I love that. So if you don't have a wife like mine, find the people who are willing to hold you to a higher standard. Absolutely. That are willing people who will, you. for those listening, because I'm a challenger, right? I like to challenge people. I like to see new insights for myself. And I love people to challenge me, like you said, growth minded people. So I'm 100% on board with that is we have to surround ourselves with people who want, have our best interests that want to lift us up and aren't afraid to challenge us and push a little, right? I mean, we hire a coach so that they can push us because we want to be our best selves. We want to be better and we need support structures in order to do that because our nature is to take the easiest route. That's the way our brain works. So we have to have somebody to kick us in the butt. Absolutely. My best coach is the one I hate calling because he makes me the most productive because I know when I do the call with him, I want it to be as short as possible. I don't like him, but I love the results because he will not let me get away with anything. Absolutely. So I wanted to make sure people had that distinction that just because they don't have a partner or, right, you can go out. That's also being proactive. Go out and find those people. Maybe they're part of a group. Like you said, you got connected with Tony Robbins community and that could surround you with people who are growth-minded and you'll find those people who could push you or 
are doing what you want to do, what you wish you could do. And then you find out how to get them to mentor you and to be part of whatever community they're in so that you can learn from them. Absolutely. And also understand yourself. Like I know I am a world-class procrastinator and I freely admit that. So I actually design my day in such a way that procrastination cannot play. So when I started training, people go, how did you become a trainer that travels around the world? Well, I volunteered at 38 events a year to give back because I learned so much, but I'm now 38 times in that energy for days at a time, which doesn't give me a chance to get into my going into that being that procrastinator. So because I understand me, I design things to make sure I don't give myself the space to sabotage. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's an amazing energy to be in. So, you know, I'm uh, also a big fan. I want to come to a point where you said, why did you delivered pizzas because you had delivered pizzas before and you chose to be a franchisee because you were already in this space. I'm a big believer of doing more with what we have that, you know, sometimes it's by our nature that we delete, distort and generalize things. So when things are stressful and we delete all the good things that we know about ourselves and focus on the bad things, or we'll generalize about how this always happens to me or, you know, these types of things. And I'm a big believer that if we can just tap into, we already have great skills. We already have knowledge. How can we do more with what we have and what we love and make more out of it? So what's your take on that? And how did that play in you making those decisions that you made? Well, and that comes really right back to the overwhelm. One of the things that I've discovered of why people get overwhelmed is let's say you have a goal or something you want to accomplish or where you think you should be. And so you're here, you've got that goal out in front of you. And the reason most people get overwhelmed is because they're not present. They're a thousand steps ahead of themselves at that goal already or in that situation. And now they're trying to figure out everything that has to be done to get them there. And all of a sudden they feel the pressure. Can I do it? The self-doubt, what sabotage is going to happen? And they end up, their mind starts going even more crazy because they're a thousand steps ahead of them. And so one of the things, and it's a quote I love, that the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And so to overcome that overwhelm, I'm teaching audiences all over the world, take that deep breath in, come back to being present and ask yourself, what's my next step? And then take that step, check in with yourself. How am I doing? Am I okay? Okay, what's my next step? And I don't want people, Penny, to think that it's easy. It's a journey. It takes practice, like anything. It takes practice. When you come back to present, you do that one step at a time and you keep, but Robert, what if I hate it when I go off track? And so I'll look at my example when I was working in the factory. So here I was, and my goal was I was going to be the general manager of a factory. I was going to work for these guys for 40 plus years. I saw the path so clearly. So all of a sudden, when the general manager, and I still remember his name, Ron Humpting, not happy with him, when he calls me in the office, tells me I'm laid off, my life majorly went on a disconnect. But I look back now, again, hindsight being 2020, had I not been laid off, I wouldn't have found Domino's. Had I not found Domino's, I wouldn't have become a franchisee. I wouldn't have gone $150,000 in debt, which led me to personal development, which led me to truly finding my passion, which is to help people and be a trainer to allow me to have the amazing life I have today. So I now look back and I go, thank you, Ron, for laying me off. Right? And I can see it with gratitude. So it's also switching and looking at the things that maybe you've gone through in the past and instead of bringing them back up and going, see, it's going to happen again and creating that stress and that overwhelm from creating it happening again, looking back and going, okay, what did I learn? And can I be grateful for that lesson? And how can I use that lesson now that if, if it happens, not when, because we don't want to attract it to us, if it happens again, what would I do different? And then that can take a big load off people's shoulders as well. Brings up for me the expression that when you're in it, you know, this too shall pass. If you can just remember that it's just a storm passing through and very often after the storm, the sun comes out and it's brighter and the grass is greener because we need to have sometimes that rain in those storms, then we can appreciate where we are that much more. So, but I find that that's a help to me is just to kind of keep that in my thoughts that this too shall pass. And 
with that strategy of just thinking about what's next and staying present, those are some really helpful tips that may seem like ridiculously simple for somebody who's in overwhelm, but it doesn't have to be complex, right? It is simple. Right. It's just not that easy to implement. It's simple, but not easy, right? I think Jim Rohn said that. And one of the things to understand too, is this where your growth-minded individuals come in. I have a friend that we have such an amazing relationship that one of our agreements with each other is that if that we're in feeling frustrated, pissed off, overwhelmed, whatever it is, we can call them up. They'll take the call. And it's simply just for me to say, Aaron, here's what's going on right now. And just let it out. He doesn't take it personally, or I don't take it personally if it's him. It's just about being able to express that energy, let it go, and then go, (sighs) because when you're in it, sometimes we just suppress it. But having someone that you know will hold the space, and it's not about having a bitch session, it's not about complaining, it's about just letting that energy out so that now you can move on. And I've found that has been one of the biggest things that has helped me, especially with what's going on in the world, because I went from traveling... 200,000 miles a year around the world doing live events to not traveling at all and having to do a total reinvent. Right here. I know. I hear you. I hear you. And all of a sudden, all that revenue gone. Thank goodness I have other businesses, but hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue gone. And I could have went there and gone into the why me victim, poor me, which I did. I want your audience to understand. I did. I did for a short amount of time. As soon as I caught it, then two powerful words came up. What's next? And my wife said, well, you've been wanting to go virtual for a while. You're at home now. Let's do it. We bought this property to build our own training center. You're home now. Let's start building it. And we broke ground in December. And we're about two weeks away from me being in my new training facility right off my house. So that as things come back to the new normal, my students will can now travel to see me instead of me having to travel so much. So it's actually taken where we wanted to be in our life and actually sped it up by about three or four years. So now I'm going, you talk about gratitude. I'm going, "Ah!" but in the moment, did I think it would work out like this? No, but I had to just keep going. Right. Absolutely. You mentioned an important word, which is letting go, right? When one is in overwhelm, how to let go. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned one way, which is having friends or support structures, you know, maybe it's a coach, maybe it's a therapist, whatever. There's lots of different roles that somebody could be. It's a safe space for you to just let it out. Do you have other strategies for letting go when you're in a place of overwhelm? I think that would be helpful for people. I don't know if I should share this because it's really silly. (laughs) Share it. I have a button on my computer that, because that's normally where the stress will come. And I push the button and Elsa comes up and uh, singing, let it go, let it go. <laughs> That's the only part of the song that I know because that trigger just also that rhyme. allows me to come back to present. <laughs> right. Hey, you know, you think so, that's funny, but we sad. have some stuff in common. I'll say that in quotes because <laughs> <Right. laughs> we do that too in our household, what? like my kids too, like, cause we love that. We used to just blare that song. I think it was for my son, he was going through like some difficult times. And I think it was just a total releaser. And so we use that as well, which is really funny. It's a powerful song, right? If you get it, it really is. And I only know those first two lines. That's all I want to know, because that's what really allows me to move forward. And I love that you are such a real person. Because your audience, if they're really getting this, is they're going to understand it doesn't matter what people perceive your success is. There's a quote again. Perceive your success is we're all the same. We're all the same. And it's just our minds that put people in different positions. And so like even me, when I'm in front of an audience of thousands of students, whatever, one of the first things I love to do is I love to go down off the stage. I'll be walking through the audience. I'll find someone who I know is tall and I'll ask them to help me out. And I'll say, can you stand up for a moment? We'll let the camera see us. So we're on the jumble screens. And I'll go, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to notice I'm short. I'm short. And I usually get a chuckle from the audience. And I said, now, why do I want you to understand that? Because I'm on the stage doesn't mean I'm any better than you or that I have a greater life or that nothing goes wrong. I'm the same as you. Is it possible I might know things that maybe you don't know? Sure. But isn't it also possible you know things that I don't know? And when I set that context at the beginning, it allows me to have then an even deeper real conversation with Mm -hmm. my audiences because... The moment, that's what also causes overwhelm. People look at someone's success and they go, well, I could never do that. Or I, 
you can never get to that space. I've gone through a lot of crap. And I share that from the stage all the time. So people understand that they're not different, that I haven't had a perfect life. And for you to get where I'm at, you have to have a perfect life. Your life is perfect. The crap you're going through is going to make you who you are. And then the question I always ask myself is, so who can I help with the crap I went through? (laughs) Right. Well, it's amazing how when you share the most difficult times, you know, that you've had and how you got through it, it's amazing how it really connects with people. So, you know, it's important to share our crap because it helps people through their crap. Yep. We all have it. Yeah. And there's people I can't relate to. I've been. And I think what you're telling me, hold on, this is an important point. You're telling me that we're all full of crap. Yep. Let it go. I just had to stick that in because I thought that was funny when that came up. (laughs) Anyway, sorry, I had to stick that in there. You've got the same work sense of humor I have. I love that. (laughs) I do. I'm a little goofy, but you know. You talk about overwhelm. One of the things I believe, there's way too many serious people on this planet. Mm. Way too many. Life's too short not to have fun and enjoy it. But Robert, how can I have fun? I'm in overwhelm. Right. So what I was just going to say that is that people are like, how can I have fun or how can I find humor in this time? So what would you say to them? One of the things I love to teach people is what I call the four phases of life that people go through. And the second phase is called, I call it the pamper phase. And the pamper phase is the one that most people don't do, which is why they end up self-sabotaging. And in the pamper phase, this is the time where you take care of you. Maybe you read a book for 20 minutes because you love reading. Maybe you plan a trip or go on a vacation if you can. But if you can't plan a vacation during that time, maybe you get your nails done. If I had hair, maybe I'd get my hair done. You know, stuff like that. You pamper yourself. You get a massage. You pamper you. People would say, Robert, why do you travel all over the world and go on a plane for 15, 16, 17 hours? And it's like, because I want to help people around the world that really want to learn. But the part of it that's selfish is because as soon as I sit on that plane, that's my time. I don't connect to the internet. I read. I watch movies because I love movies. I eat some good food and drink some great wine. And that's my pamper time. That's me taking care of me so that when I have to be on and really be there taking care of thousands of people, I can be present for them because I've taken care of me. And one of the reasons people get overwhelmed, Penny, is they forget to take care of themselves. They feel it's selfish. They feel they don't deserve it. But, you know, it comes back to that old saying, you cannot give what you don't have. And it is a practice. I ended up starting training. I was living my passion too much. I forgot to take care of me. I ended up having to take a year off because I was burnt out. But the Mm -hmm. year turned into three and a half because I also herniated a disc, not taking care of myself on the stage. And I went through two back surgeries. Mm. And you talk about overwhelm then, because now six weeks in bed, I can't move. I'm not allowed to get out of the bed. You become very humble very quickly in a situation mm. like that. Yeah, well, we forget in the moment the cost of filling every second, you know, the cost of busy and the cost of distraction and the cost mm. of hyper focus, even, right? Mm. Is we need space to regenerate, right? I mean, if you look at any athlete, there's always an off season. And so we don't have an off season. So we have to build in those little breaks, right? So those little mini breaks to whether it's within your day or whether it's really taking the weekends, if you don't do that, then you're bound to come to a point of burnout. And that's exactly it. And I'll use today as a perfect example. I was up for my first call was 6 a.m. my time. And so I'm up at five to get ready and going. And I was busy all the way through. And I got a break at 1030 with my first break offline from doing trainings, from doing interviews, from doing all the stuff. And I went back to the bedroom. My wife was in there and she said, okay, you're done that call. I said, yeah. She says, what's next? I said, well, I'm now going to break. So I'm going to do some stuff. She goes, no, you look exhausted. Take half an hour and sleep. And I'm like, no, she goes, get in bed and have a sleep. So I set my alarm. I took a 30 minute nap because I knew I still had a lot I wanted to accomplish today. That's the key. If we don't do it, we're no different than your listeners. No, absolutely. You know, napping, Einstein, Edison, they were all big nappers. Those people who 
you know, are known for accomplishing so much, they're appreciating the value of where creativity comes from. And we have to give ourselves that space to sleep, to move, to eat right. And those types of things matter in our brain function. Yeah. And I found, especially after my back surgeries, the greatest way, because my back still knots up. It's been 12 years since I had my last back surgery. And I off all medications in that, which I've been very diligent on making sure I stay in shape to never go through that again. But there's days where I feel it nodding up. And so for me, the easiest way to relax my back is I go for a long walk. And when I started doing that, I also noticed that's when I started getting the most clarity. Great ideas come, right? I love doing that. I'm quieting my mind. And all of a sudden it's just like, boom, boom, boom. I had to start making sure I had my cell phone with my notes so I could sit there. And if something hit me, because if you could say something, someone goes, what did you just say? And you're like, I don't know. Right. I know. I know. Right. And you're like, oh, I got to capture that. Yeah. So I've learned to, and it's one of the clues I love to give people is write it down. My phone, I'll either do a quick voice memo or I'll put it onto my notes so then I can let it go. See, and even that letting it go. Why do people get it wrong? Because, oh, I got to remember this. And then they stress so much trying to remember it that then they forget it anyway. And then they stress out that, why did I forget that? I was so And then they forget 10 times more of other things because of all that. Yep. Totally. Take the song and change it. Write it down. Write it down. There you go. That's, I think that's (laughs) David Allen's core song (laughs) with getting things done, right? Yeah. So let's do this. I'd love to continue chatting. We could chat all day, but I want to bring the session to a close, ask you a couple of closing questions. And then I want to ask you where people can find out more about you. So I always ask this question because I find it fascinating, the different answers. What is your definition of productivity and why? Yeah, because people can be so busy, but not productive. That was me. So now for me, productivity is I will carve out what I call focus time. And I love that you're the focusologist. I hope I said that right. Yeah. And because I found I can be way more productive in an hour to two hours of focus time than I am in just eight hours of regular, oh, I got to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. So I utilize my calendar and I never used to. I live by my calendar now. But the key thing I do is I make sure before I schedule anything else, I key, I schedule in my balance pieces, the pampering time, the family time, all the things that regenerate who I am. So that when I also know that, okay, today's going to be a busy day. I've got 18 hours of calls and trainings and work to do on those rare cases. That's a long day like that. I can get it done. When I was traveling, I'd be on stage for 12 hours a day, three to five days straight. It allowed me to do that. And when I'm off stage, I'd have half an hour. And I like to keep it to, I learned this from one of my partners because he does everything on his computer. He sets his timer for 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. And even, doesn't matter what he's doing. The moment that timer goes off, he stops, he stands up, puts music on, he dances around for a while, and then he sits back down, resets his timer and goes. And that's how he stays focused. So I started incorporating things like that into my life. And I'll purposely only schedule a maximum two hours to focus on something Yep. before I have to totally change and go in a different energy, different direction. So right. I don't know that, that can be different for everybody, right? That can be yeah. those time windows can be different. They could be shorter, right? So some people don't have yeah. as long of an attention span to go two hours. So it could be 30 minutes, right? I think it's important for people to find where their sweet spot is. Well, and that's why I said maximum two hours, because you're exactly yeah. right. I usually go 30 to 45 minutes is kind of a natural time for me that I found I get the most productive stuff done. Awesome. So are there any cool app that might really support you? I'm not a huge app fan that I've got a ton of them, but I've got a couple that really are so important to me. Do you have one or two that if they were to like wipe off your phone, not including email or calendar, But is there one or two that you would put on there that you'd say, I use this daily to support working efficiently and effectively? Yeah. The one I use the most is called Calm, C-A-L-M. And I use it because when I do my 20 minute breaks to quiet my mind, I love to listen to the sound of rain and I just put it on in my earphones. And I, for 20 minutes, I listen to the sound of rain and I just close my eyes, take some deep breaths, come back to present. So that's the number one. The number two is kind of a conundrum on this one. Because I'm in the middle of getting version two ready. (laughs) It's my app called Amentora. Version one, which we've taken offline now. But what it is, is the reason it's an absolute is because I built it for me. I create my vision boards on it, but I also put my success and gratitude journals on it. 
so that because every day I start my day when I wake up, I write down the five things from the day before that I'm thankful for and or grateful for. And mm-hmm. that can include people as well. And what my success is for the day. So because I like to write it down, I decided to create an app that had that integrated as well. So that's going to be the other app that will not come off my phone because I'll be using it again daily once we get the second version of Awesome. I'm a journal person with that, but I've been practicing that for how old's my son now. So I've been practicing that for almost 16 years nice. every day, writing down my gratitude yeah. because the more you focus on it, the more it grows. And even yes. in the most difficult and trying times, it helps you to recenter yourself and be grounded and present and focused on what's good versus yes. always filling yourself with what's not. So I'm a huge believer in that as well. A big practice that I started doing since the pandemic, and I encourage my students to do, because I think the worst thing they could have called it was social distancing. Okay, physical distancing, sure, to, to keep Right, safe. it's not social. But now we need to be social more than ever. And so I share with my students, and I do this myself, is I will reach out to three people randomly a day to ask three words. How are you? And just to check in with them. And it's amazing how many people I get responses going, I needed you to touch base with me and ask me that today. And because we don't know what's going on in other people's lives, we get so caught up in ours. But research has proven one of the quickest ways to get out of a depression is to help other people. Mm -hmm. And so by taking the focus off you and putting on others, how are you? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden now it activates that. And so it becomes a beautiful, it helps you, it helps them. And it's just a great way. I've one of the biggest blessings of this whole thing that's gone on in the world is I've had deeper connections with friends and family that I haven't had connections with in years because I've been too busy. And now having these conversations, these connections, that's dropped my overwhelm, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, so tell people how they can get a hold of your best selling book and connect with you personally. Absolutely. Facebook, uh, my fan page is the easiest way to stay connected with me. I'm now, I guess, my virtual assistant says I'm now going to be on LinkedIn and Instagram as well. <laughs> We're getting all that set up. But I would love as a gift for your students to, or your listeners to be able to download the ebook version of my international bestselling book, Success Left a Clue. And they just go to robertreopel.com to get that. And they'll be able to download it as our gift to them. But I am going to warn them, Penny. It's not a book that you just read. The third step, because it's six steps I lay out in the book, the third step to creating the life you absolutely love is taking action. So throughout the book, I have action steps. And I'll even say when they start reading again, did you do the last action? If not, stop reading now, go back, complete the action before you read. Because I want them to understand that action is how they get through overwhelm. Action is how they develop the life that they truly want. So it's an actual workbook not uh-huh. just a book to read. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed chatting with you today. And I know that the listeners have taken away a couple of nuggets that are that they can put into practice right away. Right now, they can take action. So according to your action formula, they can be action figures. <laughs> but I love that. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks again. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Penny. And you guys who are listening, who are watching, however you're catching us, thank you for being here. And I do encourage you after every one of these shows to walk away with one action that you're going to take. I'm also very action oriented. And I believe too, that it's taking that action that's going to help you through your challenges. It's going to help to build your business or improve your relationships. It's going to help you to further and advance your health. So whatever area is you've got to take action to make it happen. So do subscribe to the podcast. Make sure that you're following, that you know when the next show is coming on. So I really look for great guests that are going to provide these actionable, valuable tips for you. So thanks for being here. My name is Penny Zanker, and this is Take Back Time. See you in the next episode. Thank you for listening. Today's topic is another opportunity for you to put the knowledge you learned into practice. Tune in again next week for more strategies that will help you have more energy and focus to get more done in less time so you can continue to take back time.